Hello, everyone. Welcome to the astronomy department here at IEG. Thank you all for participating in this seminar. Today we welcome Dr. Rafael Alves Batista, junior leader at Universidade Autónoma de Madrid in Spain. For those who don't, who don't know Rafael, he worked as a postdoc in uh, Oxford University, Universidade de São Paulo, and Red Bull University. He got his PhD in physics in Hamburgo University and uh, undergrad and master degree in Universidade Estadual de Campinas. He focused primarily in astroparticle physics and multi-messenger astronomy, but also works in areas such as astrobiology, cosmology, and fundamental physics. Today, Rafael is going to present the talk, Multi-Messenger's Insights into the Ultra-High Energy Universe. Questions can be addressed to Rafael after the presentation. And if you're um, following the seminar via YouTube or Google Meet, you can also send the question using the chat, and we will read uh, afterwards. Rafael, thank you for accepting our invitation, and please feel free to start. OK, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. After a while, so I was a postdoc here at uh, IAG a few years ago, so yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, multi-messenger insights into the ultra-high energy universe, which is a very generic title that doesn't really mean anything, because I can talk about a bunch of things that are completely unconnected to each other, but this is the only title I could think of that connects uh, all the topics that I want to, to show you. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so uh, to get started, oops, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I got it. So uh, to get started, the idea of this talk is essentially to connect cosmic particles and uh, essentially to address the whole motivation for that is to address how cosmic particles, whatever energy they have, even though I'm talking, I'm going to focus more at the ultra high energies. The idea is to use whatever cosmic particles are available to us to try to understand like their origins and how they are produced. So essentially, they're cosmic accelerators in the case of high energy particles. Uh, and also, we can try to think of uh, how to use these particles to study fundamental physics and cosmology. So the whole idea is the following. If we are trying to do to unveil the sources of these particles, we can just use these cosmic particles and knowing the fundamental physics, so how these particles propagate in the universe, how they travel from their source or their sources to Earth. And uh, if we know uh, the cosmology, so what happens in between, like at the large scales of the universe, we can try to unveil the sources of these particles. If we are looking, if we are trying to do some kind of fundamental physics, so if we are trying to use this type of particles to understand, uh, for example, how particle interact interactions could be different from the standard model, uh, we are looking essentially for uh, the fundamental physics. And in this case, we would need to have the information of these cosmic particles and, of course, cosmological information. And we would also need to know the sources of these particles. So uh, if we know the sources, if we know cosmology, and if we detect these particles here from Earth, we can try to do some fundamental physics. Uh, when I say like fundamental physics, I mean particle interactions, like uh, deviations from the standard kinematics that we have for particle interactions. And uh, we can also do some kind of quantum gravity studies, given the high energies that some of these cosmic particles can reach. Oops, I'm not pointing it correctly. Yes. Uh, OK, and now the third direction would be if we tr are trying to learn something about cosmology using this cosmic messenger as well, you would need to fix the fundamental physics, so the standard interactions that we know. And we would need to know the sources of these particles, which are essentially the, their cosmic accelerators. And then we could learn something about cosmology. And when I say cosmology here, I mean like photon backgrounds. For example, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, or the EBL, the extragalactic ground light. So all these are things that we can try to learn uh, using uh, this type of the, the green arrow here. Uh, yeah, this green arrow. We would need to know the particles, the sources, and the properties, the fundamental physics. Uh, and when I talk about uh, ultra high energy particles, I mean a bunch of different things, uh, depending on who you ask. The definition of what ultra high energy means is going to be very different. So. Uh, when I talk about ultra high energy particles, I'm usually talking about, in the case of cosmic rays, those with energies above 10 to the 17 or 10 to the 18 electron volts, more or less. 
Uh, and this type of cosmic rays with energies, very high energies, ultra high energies, they are also directly related to these neutrinos that are observed, for example, by the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. And there is also this gamma rays at lower energies, lower compared to this. These are also called high energy gamma rays, even though they are like 10 orders of magnitude lower in energy than these cosmic rays, but yeah, they're called high energy. Uh, so what I'm going to try to argue today is that the processes that generate this type of cosmic rays, they are intrinsically connected to the process that generate this type of particles, the ne these neutrinos here in purple and these gamma rays shown in green. So the whole point of this talk, which is very generic, is to try to make a connection between these three messengers, hence the title multi-messenger. So I'm going to try to connect ultra high energy cosmic rays with high energy neutrinos and high energy gamma rays. And uh, let's make a cleaner version of that picture. So we have these three messengers of interest, the cosmic rays at high energy, so above 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 electron volts, neutrinos, and uh, gamma rays. Gamma rays at these energies, they are typically observed with experiments like uh, the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is a satellite. Uh, there are also other observatories uh, operating at these energies here, others in construction like CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, uh, that it's been uh, built nowadays, and uh, IAG is actually involved with that, is helping build that, uh, that telescope. And here, uh, the main observatory is IceCube, at these PV energies. And here we have observatories like the Pierre Roger Observatory that detects all particles, even neutrinos and gamma rays. Well, neutrinos and gamma rays with these energies, they were not detected. But these two observatories, Roger and the telescope array, could, in principle, also detect these particles. And the detection strategies that are usually used for uh, detecting these particles is more or less the following. This is a very general overview. Uh, it's actually not very detailed. There are other complementary techniques that we should keep in mind. Okay, but uh, this is just a general idea of how these high energy particles, these high energy messengers or ultra high energy messengers are uh, detected. We have Earth, we have the atmosphere here shown through this uh, very thin uh, black line. And let's suppose we have cosmic rays impinging upon the atmosphere. As these cosmic rays, which are essentially atomic nuclei with high energies, as they enter our atmosphere, they produce a shower of particles with a bunch of particles, like we have kaons, pions, and protons, and other stuff. The first interactions of these cosmic rays with the atmosphere emit some kind of a fluorescence light due to the ex excitation of the nitrogen in the air. And this fluorescence light can be detected by some uh, fluorescence telescopes or fluorescence detectors here at Earth or in space. So you can look up from Earth like this and look for these fluorescence lights to study these cosmic rays or you can also do this the other way around. You can put some satellites in space and look down to study the fluorescence light emitted by these cosmic rays. Uh, we also have uh, par a bunch of particles being produced and some of these particles, they will reach what we call particle detectors. These particle detectors, they are things like water Cherenkov tanks. So they are just sealed water tanks. Uh, and when these particles, they cross the water here, they emit Cherenkov radiation because they have uh, velocities higher than the speed of light in water, which is what's inside these tanks. And uh, the Cherenkov radiation is what is effectively detected here inside. And uh, we also have, of course, a bunch of other particles. And uh, this whole process of particle emission, uh, particle production, it's actually a cascade in the atmosphere. And there is also the emission of radiation, electromagnetic radiation in the radio uh, spectrum. And this radio uh, emission can be detected with like antennas that we have here at ground level. Now let's suppose that we have gamma rays impinging upon the atmosphere. Well, these gamma rays, they can be directly detected by satellites. Before I mentioned like the Fermi satellite, the Fermi satellite is one example of this. And uh, these gamma rays, they also produce a particle shower similar, but not exactly like this. Uh, and this particle shower will produce, like it's mostly composed of gamma rays and electrons like these ones. 
And it will emit also Cherenkov light in the atmosphere that can be detected with Cherenkov telescopes. That's why we have things like the Cherenkov Telescope Array. That's the name of the observatory, because essentially that observatory aims at observing. It's just like telescopes like this, detecting Cherenkov light from these particle showers induced by gamma rays entering our atmosphere. There are also other techniques for other types of particles. For example, uh, we can have uh, I the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in the South Pole. In that case, the neutrinos, they almost cross the Earth. Oops. Uh, yes. Okay. So the neutrinos would go very close to Earth and get into the ice and produce also Cherenkov radiation. Well, not in water, but in the ice in this case. So that's how you detect, you would detect uh, things like neutrinos. So when we talk about ultra-high energy particle astrophysics, we have to keep in mind, again, all these messengers, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gamma rays. And they are all giving you complementary information. Uh, let's take a look at this uh, purple line here, this horizontal purple line that I drew manually here. If you take a look at this line, oops, uh, yeah, you see that the amount of energy per area, per time, per solid angle, which is shown here, it's kind of the flux, the energy flux. Uh, as a function of the energy for these three different messengers, it's more or less roughly the same. So let's take here these energies of uh, 10 to the 3, so uh, 10 to the 12 electron volts, 10 to the 15 electron volts, and 10 to the 18 electron volts. These three things are comparable. Therefore, we can think of, okay, if they are comparable, there might be something interesting going on, or there might not. I don't know, but let's just entertain this hypothesis for a while. Do they have a common origin? That's the hypothesis we are entertaining now. Because of this apparent coincidence, we are going to explore the hypothesis that they have a common origin. If they have a common origin, in some way, these, cosmic, these neutrinos and these gamma rays here, they are produced by these cosmic rays if this hypothesis is true. And this production, this connection can happen in an astrophysical object, so you'd have cosmic rays interacting inside some kind of astrophysical object, and these interactions will produce the gamma rays and neutrinos that we see here at lower energies. Or this can happen during the journey of these cosmic rays from their sources to Earth. Well, but in order to really uh, uh, determine whether this hypothesis is true and to distinguish between these two scenarios, we need to understand, to understand how these particles are produced and how they propagate to Earth. Uh, so let's take a look at the main messengers here, and I also added electrons for completeness, uh, and the reason will become clear very soon. I'm entertaining the hypothesis that the photons, or gamma ray photons, that we see and the neutrinos, they are produced by these cosmic rays. Well, if, if we are looking at high energy particles, how do these high energy particles get their energy? We have a whole field, high energy astrophysics. How is high energy astrophysics different from standard astrophysics or low energy astrophysics? The reason for that is that there are some processes happening in astrophysical objects, usually related to electromagnetic uh, acceleration of particles. So we have strong magnetic fields around astrophysical objects, and these strong magnetic fields can accelerate particles. But magnetic fields can help accelerate particles if they are charged. And therefore, only cosmic rays and electrons can be accelerated. This still doesn't answer the question of uh, how do photons and neutrinos get to high energies? But we can understand via this type of acceleration how cosmic rays and electrons, how they get their energy. And the way to think of that is essentially through this diagram, which is the so-called Hilas diagram, which shows, oops, I put my hand here. Yeah. Uh, and this diagram shows essentially the magnetic field of an object as a function of the typical size or radius of an object. Let's just say that the object is like a sphere, right? A way to accelerate particles is the following. The stronger the magnetic field, the shorter the radius, the Larmor radius or the gyro radius of a particle. Why? The particles will just, uh, just spiral around in place. They cannot move very far because the magnetic field is very strong and it kind of confines the particle. The particle can only escape a given region of a given size, here uh, R. So a particle can only exceed, uh, escape the region of R, if the magnetic field is weaker 
uh, such that the radius that the particles would describe due to the magnetic field would be larger than the size of the object. That's the condition for escape, right? Uh, and this happens as particles gain energy when they get to a maximum energy. The higher the energy, the more difficult it is for magnetic fields to confine this particle, and the more likely it is that they can escape. And what are the conditions? Well, we can have very large objects, such as galaxy clusters, confining uh, uh, particles like cosmic rays or electrons. Uh, and in the case of galaxy clusters, the magnetic field is relatively small, but they are very big. On the other hand, we can also have very tiny objects like magnetars with very strong magnetic fields. So these two things are degenerate, right? I can have either a very strong magnetic field uh, without, uh, with a very small radius or vice versa. And uh, that's how we can accelerate cosmic rays and electrons in principle. Uh, therefore, these two messengers, cosmic rays and electrons, they are directly accelerated by astrophysical objects. And how do these neutral particles get to high energies? Well, there are processes like interactions between cosmic rays, which are essentially atomic nuclei, and electrons with photons or with gas and stuff that is present in the universe or in the surrounding of astrophysical objects. And these interactions can be responsible for producing the others, like photons and uh, neutrinos. And uh, what I call the title of the talk, it says uh, ultra high energy universe. And when I say ultra high energy universe, I mean that these primary particles, they had ultra high energies. And then the particles that were produced by a high ener ultra high energy cosmic ray, or actually electrons don't, uh, don't reach ultra high energies because they are kind of killed uh, due to synchrotron emission. But essentially, ultra high energy particle astrophysics, according to this definition, it deals with ultra high energy cosmic rays and the photons and neutrinos produced via these interaction processes. And I'm going to talk about these interaction processes because so far I have not uh, really explained them yet. So, uh, what happens in an astrophysical object? Let's suppose we have this object here, it can be anything, this is just an illus illustration, and we have a cosmic ray leaving this astrophysical object, but very close to it still. So the interaction of this cosmic ray with the gas here, for example, let's suppose this orange region of the astrophysical object, it's full of gas and radiation. The cosmic ray will bump into this gas and uh, onto these photons, the radiation that is present there. And these interactions will produce, for example, neutrinos, or it will produce gamma rays. And gamma rays will do the same, and they bump on onto other particles and produce electrons. And electrons will bump onto photons and produce more photons, and so on. And the object can also emit gravitational waves. So we have to really make sense of, to make sense of this astrophysical object, we have to combine all these messengers within a single framework. OK, so I talked about how these particles, they, can, they are connected through some kind of processes uh, happening in the source around an astrophysical object. Now let's take a look at what happens uh, when they travel to Earth. Let's take first cosmic rays. So once again, cosmic rays are just atomic nuclei, let's say like a hydrogen uh, nucleus, which is just a proton or something heavier. Cosmic rays, they leave an astrophysical object and they travel through space. And we see that their trajectories are curved. Why? Well, because there are magnetic fields outside our galaxy and in our galaxy here. And that's why their trajectory is curved. And uh, if this cosmic ray is some kind of atomic nucleus heavier, it can disintegrate along the way, producing other type of uh, cosmic ray nuclei, also with high energies. Uh, there are also other processes that are going on. For example, let's suppose that we have CMB well, let's not suppose we do have uh, cosmic microwave backgrounds permeating the whole universe, right? So if a proton left this source, this proton will likely, uh, after some distance, bump onto a CMB photon, producing like protons and pions and so on. And uh, this process, like the decay of these particles here, the pions, they will produce neutrinos, and the decay of this one will produce photons. And that establishes a connection between these cosmic rays with high energies with neutrinos and photons. There are also other processes, like the same type of processes here, let's say with a cosmic microwave background photon, can produce electrons and positrons. 
Uh, in the case of gamma rays leaving an astrophysical object and traveling and propagating in the universe, what we have is that they can produce via interactions with pervasive photon fields, again, like the CMB or like the extragalactic background light or yeah, just radiation that it's around. It can produce electrons and positrons. And these electrons and positrons, well, if there, is a mag there are magnetic fields in the universe, and we know there probably is magnetic field everywhere, probably, they will open up with a given opening angle, and then they will travel a little bit, and then they will bump into more photons and produce more gamma rays, and this process will happen many times. This is called an elect electromagnetic cascade. So whenever we, we see a gamma ray source, we cannot be 100% sure that what we are seeing is actually this gamma ray that left the object. Let's suppose we have a gamma ray telescope. We just point it at the sky. We look into an astrophysical object. Can we be sure that what we are seeing in gamma rays is actually what left the source? No, we cannot. Because these processes at these high energies, that's the main difference. At these energies, these type of processes, they occur. And what we might be seeing is actually a secondary gamma ray, like this one, that was produced via the interaction first of a photon with another photon producing electrons and positrons. And then these electrons and positrons produced the photons that we are actually seeing here from Earth. So what we can say is that gamma ray astrophysics at high energy is not direct observation. It can be indirect. Well, it can also be direct. It depends actually on the kinematics of this process. How often does this process happen? What's the typical distance that this photon here has to, uh, this gamma ray, high energy gamma ray, has to travel before it bumps into a photon and so on? Well, I'm also talking about neutrinos. I talked about cosmic rays, I talked about gamma rays, and what about neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are great because they are not deflected by magnetic fields, they just travel in a straight line, but they oscillate. So uh, these might change things here at Earth because our detector might be set up to detect one type of neutrino, one flavor of neutrino, like electron, muon, or tau. Uh, but they oscillate along the way, and therefore the picture is not so simple. But in general, neutrinos, they travel almost unimpeded, and they don't really interact a lot along the way. So it's relatively easy to model their journey. Well, as I said before, there is a bunch of photon backgrounds that are present in the universe. I said, like the CMB, right? There is like the, uh, in other frequencies as well. This is just the microwave, cosmic microwave background. And if we, with, if we put all the cosmological radiation fields together, what we have here, we have like a kind of a radio background that it's the result of integrated star formation processes along the whole history of the universe. We have here the cosmic microwave background, the CMB that we all know. It's just a line because it's very well known. It's a black body. And we have here the EBL, which is the extragalactic background light, which is essentially uh, infrared and optical uh, frequencies. Okay, those are the backgrounds that particles, when they are traveling in the universe, they interact with. So once again, if we have a cosmic ray or a photon traveling in the universe, they will possibly, depending on the distance they traveled, bump into a photon of the, one of these energies, of one of these backgrounds. But what you can see here is that these backgrounds, they are kind of... I also said that when these particles are traveling, because we are trying to understand how they propagate in the universe, they can be deflected by magnetic fields. In the case of cosmic rays, this is trivial, because cosmic rays are charged particles, and they are just deflected, of course. Uh, in the case of gamma rays, they are not directly deflected. However, the electrons that are produced along the way can be deflected by these magnetic fields. So. Uh, we are trying to make sense of all these messengers together, and therefore we have to consider the effect of intergalactic magnetic fields on their propagation. We have magnetic fields intergalactic, so outside our own galaxy and between other galaxies, and we have inside our own galaxy, and so on. Uh, so if we take a look at the large-scale structure of the universe, like at very, very large scale, hundreds of megaparsec, what we see, what we are seeing in this video is essentially kind of the magnetic field in the large scale structure of the universe. The green dots that we are seeing here, they are clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies, they have stronger magnetic fields, generally speaking. You can see that the green dots, they are
sort of connected by these filamentary purple structures. They are the so-called filaments. Filaments, they don't have a magnetic field as strong as cluster of galaxies, but they do have magnetic fields. So we have to take them into account if we want to make sense of uh, multi-messenger observations. And most of this region here, it's black. These black regions, they are uh, essentially the cosmic voids. They are just empty regions. However, depending on how the magnetic fields in our universe originated, these black regions, they can also have magnetic fields. So how can I be sure of that? Well, we can try to observe magnetic fields, but observing magnetic fields at the large scale structure of the universe, it's extremely difficult. Uh, so a way to try to understand that would be to use uh, simulations like this one and uh, just check what's the fraction of the volume of the universe, if this volume is large enough, that would contain like magnetic fields that are strong. M strong magnetic fields will affect the propagation of my particles, the cosmic rays, the gamma rays, or uh, whatever, right? Okay, so, uh, and to do that, essentially we just plot the cumulative distribution of the magnetic field in this volume. Uh, actually, it's the inverse, one minus the cumulative distribution of the magnetic field. And uh, that's what's shown here. However, as you can see, this is very different according to different models. Uh, in particular, the magnetic fields in the black regions here, the cosmic voids, it changes a lot uh, depending on the model that we are considering. These voids, they fill at least 20% of the volume of the universe. It can be up to 80, but uh, the magnetic field can be strong or weak. Like it changes by one order of magnitude, like here. So, uh, but you have to consider it diagonally because we also don't know, we don't know the strength nor the exact volume that it occupies. So this is very uncertain. So we are kind of uh, hitting a wall in terms of uh, modeling, right? Because we need to understand these magnetic fields to understand how to make sense of multi-messenger observations, but it's very uncertain, especially due to the uncertainties in the magnetic fields in the voids. Okay, and uh, so far I've been giving you the ingredients necessary to really make sense of astrophysical observations, what we have in terms of cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gamma rays, like multi-messenger observations. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to actually combine all of these together as uh, ingredients for simulations. So what I'm actually trying to do here is to combine all this information and try to model how these particles travel in the universe to simulate their propagation. So uh, to simulate their propagation, what we usually have is some kind of astrophysical input, which tells us like, where are our astrophysical sources in the universe? What are our sources in the universe, like which type of astrophysical object, where they are located, what's the energy of the particle, whatever particle we are talking about, that they are emitting, uh, what's the time dependence of this emission, and so on. And then once we have these in inputs, we just have to perform the propagation, or just have to perform the propagation because that essentially means that we have to model the interactions of these particles with whatever is there in the universe. That means magnetic fields, that means photons like the CMB, the extragalactic background light, the radio background that I mentioned before, all these things. So we have to model these particle interactions. Sometimes particles are accelerated. Sometimes the density of gas is also too high and there are interactions and so on. So this is not trivial. On the contrary, this is quite uh, complex. But once we have that, from the inputs to the, through the propagation to the outputs, we can get things that we're interested in, like the spectrum. The spectrum essentially just tells us what's the energy dependence of, uh, that we get here at Earth for a given type of particle. Uh, also the composition. The composition essentially tells us that in the case of cosmic rays, it's like one type of cosmic rays and not the other. So they're relative abundances. Or in the case of neutrinos, that would be the neutrino flavor that we get here at Earth. And the arrival directions, which tells us essentially for a given type of uh, astrophysical source and magnetic field, because magnetic field deflects the particles, right? Where do we expect to see the image of these particles in the sky with our uh, telescope? And of course, the arrival, okay, and the arrival times as well. And this is what we effectively 
compare with the observations. So in order to do this modeling of the propagation that I just mentioned, well, we have to mix all those ingredients that I've been mentioning before um, based on models and so on. And that's not trivial. And th this should be done in a self-consistent way for gamma rays, for electrons, for cosmic rays, for neutrinos, for everything using the same ingredients. And this is very challenging, computationally speaking. So uh, in order to scan the full parameter space uh, of uncertainties for these models, we need some kind of uh, framework that allows us to perform multi-messenger simulations. And that's what this code called uh, CIRPROPA does. So uh, CIRPROPA, many of you I know that oops, uh, have been using it uh, for a while uh, or are going to use it at some point. It's a public available uh, Monte Carlo code developed by myself and, uh, and uh, collaborators. It allows the propagation of all these particles that I've been talking about in the universe, like outside our galaxy, in our galaxy. Uh, so if we have a cosmic ray producing a gamma ray, this is taken into account, and all these processes that I've been mentioning so far. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's fully parallelized and so on. And uh, what's interesting is that this code, it can treat many processes, in particular particle interactions. Like cosmic rays, they can, as I mentioned before, photo disintegrate, so they interact with a photon and they break down and become another cosmic ray nucleus. They can produce electron-positron pairs, for example. They can uh, produce pions that will then decay and produce other particles and so on. Uh, photons, we have processes that uh, are valid for photons and for electrons and for neutrinos. Well, they just oscillate, so we don't really have to worry too much about them. Uh, wh but what's interesting is that all these blobs here, each one of these blobs corresponds to a type of particle. But if we are working with your own type of particle, uh, if we have a new particle here, you can just the code is modular, so you can just uh, connect it here to everything else, to the whole framework of the code. So uh, it's very interesting, and uh, what we are aiming for, it's a unified framework for ultra-high energy multi-messenger studies nowadays, uh, high and ultra-high energy, I should say. It has many applications, uh, well, I don't have time to, to mention. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk about this uh, later. And now, how do we make sense of ultra high energy observations? I don't know if you've been following what I've been trying to say so far, or if I got this message across, but I'm, uh, I laid out all the ingredients needed to understand how cosmic rays are connected to neutrinos and gamma rays. I started with that hypothesis that there might be a common origin for all these type of uh, messengers. And then I laid out all the ingredients uh, to investigate whether they are connected via some kind of propagation, so things that happen during their journey to Earth, or to some kind of uh, process that happened in situ, so in the astrophysical object. And now we are going to use that to try to interpret the observations. And let's go back to this thematic plot here that we have. Once again, cosmic rays, neutrinos, gamma rays. I asked before, are they connected? Well. If you remember, there was like that purple line here. I said, okay, there seems to be a coincidence. This coincidence might mean absolutely nothing, but it might also mean something. Let's investigate that. And now I'm asking whether these uh, cosmic rays here and these neutrinos and these gamma rays, they are connected via some kind of cosmogenic connection. And when I say cosmogenic, I mean, these neutrinos and these gamma rays were produced by these cosmic rays when they are traveling cosmologically. So their journey, intergalactic journey to Earth. So these are uh, were generated during propagation. Let's investigate this hypothesis, and let's take a look at this high-energy cosmic rays here first. Well, there are obs observations by the Pierre Roger Observatory, and they show like this energy spectrum. Uh, essentially, we can see here, uh, like this energy spectrum, it's multiplied by energy uh, squared. Uh, and we can see this behavior here, right? There is a lot of particles with lower energies compared to the high energies one, ones. And uh, the composition of this cosmic rays, it's shown here. Uh, forget about the technicalities. This X max is essentially just tells you if it's like more close to a proton or to an iron nucleus, because we don't know exactly what type of uh, atomic nucleus the cosmic ray is. Uh, it's something in between, probably. Uh, so forget about this. This is essentially just the composition, so just the atomic number, uh, kind of, just the atomic number of the cosmic ray. So these are the observations. 
And if the hypothesis is true, and once again, the hypothesis that I had before was this, is there a cosmogenic connection? Does, do these cosmic rays here produce the neutrinos and the gamma rays? Well, considering this data, let's see what's the prediction. If this is true, let's just plug this into that simulation framework that I mentioned before, CR proper, and see how many neutrinos and how many photons we get. And uh, if we do that, these are the observations. Uh, and we try to fit that, the ultra high energy cosmic ray spectrum and their composition. So we, we allow the cosmic ray composition to be like uh, protons, which are essentially hydrogen nuclei, helium, nitrogen, iron, whatever you have in between. And then if we do that and, the, and compute the flux of neutrinos here at Earth, we get that the flux of neutrinos, it's way below what's observed, right? What's observed is this. This is what Ice Cube sees. But the flux that we expect, according to the ultra high energy cosmic rays observa uh, ultra high energy cosmic ray observations, is very low. Therefore, the hypothesis that I had, are these neutrinos and photons produced by the cosmic rays during propagation? Probably no. This is probably false. Now, we can also do the same for the photons. So are the photons produced by ultra high energy cosmic rays interacting with stuff during their intergalactic propagation? That's possible. However, the neutrino result uh, according to the photon result, but not according to the neutrino result. So neutrinos, the flux is much lower than observed. And for photons, uh, it's possible, but it might also not be possible. It might also be somewhere here, depending on the confidence level you take. So this hypothesis is not really favored, right? So let's take a look at another hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that these neutrinos and these photons, they are not produced by these cosmic rays during their propagation, but due to some kind of process happening in the astrophysical object that produced these cosmic rays. So the cosmic rays are being accelerated, they are bumping into gas, radiation, in the astrophysical object and producing this other stuff. Let's see if this hypothesis is true. Well, if this hypothesis is, is true, so if there is like a source connection, let's take one example. Let's take as an example clusters of galaxies. So this is one cluster of galaxy, what we are seeing in color here. It's the magnetic field of this cluster. As you might recall from one of my first slides, the magnetic field is very important in general because it traps particles, right? And in fact, what you can see is that for high energy particles, this is one EV. EV is 10 to the 18 electron volts. So this is 10 to the 18 electron volts, 10 to the 17 electron volts. What we see is that the low energy particle, it remains, here we have three particles it remains trapped for very long in the center of this cluster. Whereas the higher energy one, it leaves the cluster sooner because its energy is higher, right? Uh, and this is very visual. If you just go down here to 0.01, you see that the particles will barely escape if you just start them in the center of this cluster. And uh, now let's try to answer the question. If we take into account galaxy clusters, and if we say that galaxy clusters have cosmic rays inside, and we let these cosmic rays interact with the gas and radiation present here. Oh, present here. Wait, uh, I'll get there. Uh, present here. <laughs> <laughs> so if we let this interaction take place, what's the flux of neutrinos and photons that we expect. So this is a very simple reasoning. I, have a, I had a hypothesis from the beginning and I'm investigating the two possibilities that come out of this hypothesis. And uh, I'm considering now only galaxy clusters and if this is true, well, I would expect the observations by Ice Cube, like let's take the blue, uh, the blue line here, right? Uh, so the green band, flux of neutrinos with some uncertainty that we get. So this green band, this is the flux of neutrinos. If we assume that cosmic rays inside clusters produce neutrinos and gamma rays, the green band shows the flux of neutrinos that we get. And this orange band shows the flux of gamma rays that we get. The observations are shown as the markers here. Well, 
Actually, this hypothesis is very interesting because what we are coming to conclude is that this is seriously uh, a possibility, right? The interaction of cosmic rays inside galaxy clusters can actually produce a bunch of neutrinos and gamma rays that might explain even 100% of the signal. Well, we know that most of this uh, gamma ray signal, it comes from other types of objects, but this one is still un unexplained, the neutrino one. So this is very interesting. We have just established a multi -messenger co via multi-messenger methods. We ju have just established a connection between these different messengers. We have said, if the hypothesis of a cosmic ray origin uh, for these neutrinos and photons is true, inside galaxy clusters, we can explain the yet unexplained neutrino flux here, and we can explain the high energies here as well. There is, of course, a, a lot of uncertainty here, but we can see that it, um, it's almost there, at least to the ballpark, which is very interesting. And uh, yeah, this work was actually uh, done here uh, when I, we started doing it uh, when I was here at uh, IAG a few years ago, and we finished F two years after I left, uh, actually, uh, 2021. Uh, but you'll see uh, Elizabeth and other people, Saqib Hussein, who was a, a PhD student here. So yeah, this is a work that uh, we did very recently with people from here. And the conclusion is striking. Uh, so there is a very clear indication that clusters of galaxies might explain most, if not all, of the neutrino flux and at least part of the gamma ray flux here. Okay, so uh, let's take into account. I first tried to, to uh, answer if there is a cosmogenic connection. It was really unclear. Uh, according to those results, it's possibly not true. Uh, we don't really have a cosmogenic connection. There might be some, but not all. And, but there might be a source connection according to this uh, result for clusters of galaxy. And uh, how do we distinguish between these uh, two scenarios? Well, to distinguish between these two scenarios, so far we have been looking at this figure. And you see that there is like uh, units of solid angle here. There is stereo radiance, but this is like a whole sky integrated signal. You're just collecting all the particles that arrive at Earth. What we can do then is instead of looking at the diffuse flux or the whole full sky fluxes, we can look at individual objects. And uh, in, to look into the individual objects, let's take a look into this one, for example, TXS 0506 plus 056, which is a blazer. And uh, this blazer, it's possibly the first uh, source of uh, high energy neutrino ever identified. It might have actually inaugurated uh, the era of high energy neutrino astronomy, not neutrino astronomy, because we have seen supernova neutrinos before. And uh, these are gamma ray observations, uh, actually. And uh, what we are seeing here, this circle, it's the location of the neutrino signal from this blazer. And uh, the colored one, it's the gamma ray observations. And there is like observation across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, from radio up to gamma rays. And this is the neutrino signal. So the question is, if we are trying to really make the case that cosmic rays might produce high energy neutrinos and gamma rays, and uh, that might be a dominant contribution to everything that we see here, uh, we have, we, uh, we can look also for ultra high energy neutrinos because the same processes, like the cosmic ray interactions, the same process that produce just moderately high energy neutrinos with 10 to the 15 electron volts, it could also produce neutrinos with higher energies. It's exactly the same process. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have looked into it uh, with like Fermilat and the Pierre Rouge Observatory and Ice Cube here, and we have compared all these three. Uh, observations, and we have shown that it's very unlikely, according to the, this ribbon, it's the expected flux of uh, neutrinos at high energies, knowing that Ice Cube observed neutrinos from this object at low energies. So yeah, it's very unlikely that we get a significant flux of uh, high energy neutrinos from this object. Uh, and now let's take a look at another object, which is this gamma ray burst 221009, which was 22, because it, this was observed on the 22nd of, oh, no, uh, on 2022, October 9th. So yeah, it was uh, more or less one year ago. And this gamma ray burst, it's actually very interesting because this was the brightest ever gamma ray burst ever observed. Uh, very energetic, uh, the brightest one in the whole history. Uh, it's even called 
Bolt, B-O-A-T, brightest of all time, because it was yeah, just yeah, ridiculously bright by orders of magnitude. And this object, it's at a redshift of 0 0.15, which means a distance of like 650 uh, megaparsec. And what's interesting is, looking back at everything I've said so far, this type of uh, object, well, it's located here at a distance of 650 megaparsec. And if you remember, this process uh, of pair production that I had before here, a high energy gamma ray will possibly interact with uh, a background photon from the uh, CMB or the EBL or another background producing pairs that can then produce high energy photons, right? So I was even saying that this is an indirect detection. And uh, if we take a look at the probability of this interaction happening, it depends on the distance this gamma ray traveled, right? Uh, what we are seeing here is the inverse distance, so the interaction rate for this process to happen. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, there was a gamma ray observatory called LASSO that observed events from this gamma ray burst with energies of, uh, I think, uh, I forgot the exact uh, energy now, but it's like 4 times 10 to the 13, so it would be somewhere here, right? Uh, and somewhere here, if you just take a look, mm, if you just take a look at this uh, mean free path, the inverse mean free path, that would be like less than 100 megaparsec, but this object, it's at 650 megaparsec. Therefore, a detection of an event with more than 10 to the 13 electron volts from an object at this distance is extremely unlikely. Extremely unlikely because we are talking about six times the mean free path, more or less. So many people were calling for some kind of exotic physics to explain it and so on. Uh, oh yeah, that's the energy, 18 TV. So yeah, two times 10 to the 13, yeah. So we don't really expect to see many gamma rays coming from this gamma ray burst. And um, so many people actually after these observations were calling, oh, there might be some uh, new physics, some dark matter, so the photons are becoming axion-like particles or uh, Lorentz invariance is broken, and, uh, and so on. I have two more, yeah. So uh, Lorentz invariance is broken, and so on. Uh, and, but there is also a very simple hypothesis in the context of everything we've been doing. If ultra high energy cosmic rays along the same lines, hence multi-messenger, produce during propagation electrons and photons that uh, can then reach Earth, we can easily explain the signal. Let's take a look at this figure here, for example. The problem I was mentioning before is the following. Because this object is too far, if gamma rays were emitted by this gamma ray burst, they would never reach Earth with, uh, uh, with 18 TV energy, as observed. However, if we consider that they left the source, which is at redshift 0 0.14, as a cosmic ray with ultra-high energy, and then they traveled to Earth. They were producing, for example, photons and electrons along the way. The electrons were producing photons and so on. Uh, as they get close to Earth, of course, fewer of these particles are produced, but they are being produced nevertheless. And therefore, we can fully explain this signal, which if we consider a primary gamma ray emission, that's an anomaly. But if you consider that the primary is a gamma ray, an ultra high energy cosmic ray, we can easily explain this observation. As we can see here, the dash dotted line here, it's uh, the, the, the sensitivity of that observatory. You can see, for example, that this orange line perfectly matches the observations at this energy of 18 TV. Uh, and the conclusion is that this type of signal within a multi-messenger context, it's completely natural. And people who have been calling for, for, for anomalous explanations for this event due to this uh, argument of pair production, that pair production would completely kill your s the signal. This is, doesn't really proceed because there is the natural explanation of ultra energy cosmic rays. And I think I'm just going to, to jump to the conclusions now because I've spoken too much. Yeah. So yeah, I started the talk uh, with this uh, plot, right? This thematic plot that shows gamma rays, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. And we don't really know the sources of these cosmic rays. We don't know the sources of these neutrinos, or at least part of the, them. Uh, 
and we don't really know the sources of some of these TV gamma rays here. And the hypothesis that I, I was discussing is, for example, if that they had a common origin, whether this common origin is cosmogenic, that means produced during propagation, or in the source. So interactions during propagation, during the journey, or in the source. And uh, we cannot really distinguish between these two scenarios. However, according to the results that I've shown so far, the uh, cosmogenic scenario seems disfavored. Uh, I've shown the, the neutrino flux for that. Uh, but the, for, for the case of galaxy clusters, we could easily explain the signal. So the question that remains is, what happens if we just extrapolate these observations, right? Because this will really uh, help us falsify, really test these type of models uh, considering galaxy clusters or cosmogenic origin, right? Uh, and uh, as a summary now, just to really conclude, uh, the main motivation for this talk was just to talk about these possible connections between what I call ultra high energy particle astrophysics, connecting these EV cosmic rays with PV neutrinos and TV photons. But many questions still remain, like the origins of these two types of particles, which type of astrophysical object can produce them, and uh, which type of astrophysical object produce part of this, and uh, whether, for example, this uh, cosmic ray spectrum, it re it's really suppressed here, or even the others, right? Or if they start to grow again at some energy, we just don't have yet uh, any detector that will allow us to do that. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is also that there is uh, an ongoing search for dark matter at these energies, uh, and that might, you know, be a background for us, or vice versa. Uh, so yeah, dark matter people they tend to really just look for the clean signal. However, this cosmogenic signal or these multi-messenger signals that I've been talking about here, they really contaminate all dark matter searches in neutrinos and gamma rays. So that's also something to be uh, taken into account. Yeah, I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Rafael, for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, I have a curiosity first. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk that there are satellites looking at the fluorescence. Uh, are they operational already? No, no, uh, they are not yet. There are some proposals. Uh, one of them is called uh, POEMA, uh, which is probe for observatory for extreme energetic, whatever. Yeah, I forgot astrophysics. But one of them is POEMA. Um, the other one is Jim Iuso, which used to be like a Japanese, European, Russian collaboration that now no longer exists for political reasons, yeah. Uh, but it didn't work out in the end, this Jim Uso. Mm -hmm. Now there is the successor K Uso, which I think they are still trying to do. Uh, the Japanese is no, uh, is no longer involved with that, but some Americans and the Europeans are. And there is still this poema, which was funded by NASA for a flight. But it's not like a, you know, just, just the prototypes. What is the typical height in the atmosphere uh, of the uh, fluorescence emission? Mm. Yeah, good question. Uh, I want to say order 30 kilometers, mm. but I'm not sure. So I in principle, it could be observed, say, by space station, for example. Yes. Uh, if, mm. yeah, if you just put the detectors there, it could, mm. in principle. OK. Uh, uh, ah, sorry to interrupt, just one more interesting thing is that if you are trying to look for that, actually, if you're just looking down, you are limited by the size of the Earth. However, some people also have the idea of putting this in a satellite orbiting Jupiter, because <laughs> then the area is much larger. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, I have seen recently uh, a map of the Milky Way produced by neutrinos. Yeah. Uh, and how does this connect with with what you are mentioning, because uh, I, I suspect, I, I'm not sure, but I, I suspect that these observations uh, comes from S-Cube. Yes. And uh, so most of those neutrinos, at least, are from galactic origin, and you have put emphasis in the extragalactic origin of these neutrinos. 
How do these things connect? Yeah, I emphasize the extragalactic origin because of the energies. At ultra high energies, they are extragalactic because they cannot, above 10 to the 15 protons, cannot be confined in the galaxy because of the magnetic field of the Milky Way. Uh, it's the same process, just a different energy for the cosmic rays. In this case, the cosmic rays are like 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 electron volts. Uh, exactly the same process, you, uh, but in this case, you have like, let's suppose a cosmic ray proton interacts with gas in the galaxy. It produces a bunch of pions. The neutron pion, neutral pion produces the photons that has been observed by Fermi, by uh, uh, the Fermi satellite many years ago, and now and the charged pions produce the neutrinos, which was recently observed by IceCube. But it's the same. Uh, and also in the IceCube analysis, they even match the Fermi uh, signal with theirs, because it's the same origin. For every neutron pion, neutral pion that, that you have, you have two charged pions, or vice versa, and therefore you expect twice more neutrinos than photons. Uh, you can even, or vice versa, I may be wrong here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rafael, for this very nice talk, very clear. And uh, I have a question also, more or less on the line of la what Laird started uh, talking, is that uh, you, uh, you have a model for the propagation of uh, cosmic rays and uh, neutrinos and uh, high energy photons. And my question is, how uh, the anisotropy of the local universe affects that? I mean, uh, you're probably dealing with not so large distance, so you have the Milky Way locally and the local group and the uh, uh, filaments and things uh, on the way. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, I went too far back. Yeah, that's the next one. Yeah, this is uh, the answer. The, uh, that depends typically on which type of messenger you're talking about. If you're talking about this cosmic rays, the interactions usually kill them for distances like at 10 to the 19 electron volts, or five times 10 to the 19 electron volts, which are the highest energies one, ones. Uh, we don't expect to see farther than maybe 100 megaparsec at mm -hmm. these energies. Therefore, uh, here we are looking at a 200 megaparsec uh, length. Uh, yeah, therefore, uh, in, this particular, in this particular case, the distance scales, they are comparable, and the anisotropy of the local universe. What we have been doing for some time, actually, is to take this type of simulations. We do them constrained, constrained cosmological simulations. And they are constrained in the sense that we know where the position of the main clusters are. And we kind of hope that we are reproducing the actual distribution of matter in the local universe. And then we place a sphere somewhere here in one of these clusters. That's the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, there is Earth. And we just shoot particles from possible sources that are distributed here. And we hope that this simulation actually captures this distribution. That's terrible, because as I've argued, you know, all the models are very are wrong, because they are very different, and you know, yeah, they are very limited. OK. And um, another, uh, another question is, um, you seem to prefer, uh, you have two hypotheses, the cosmo, cosmo Cosmogenic. Cosmogenic <laughs> source yeah. and uh, the source uh, uh, model. And uh, about the source model, as far as I remember, at least for the very high energy, ultra high energy cosmic rays, there was a, uh, the, the preferred source was AGNs. But you talk also about uh, clusters of galaxies. And uh, how is it today? I mean, uh, how okay. is yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, there are two ultra high energies. <laughs> uh, one, one ultra high energy is the one that it's like 10 to the 18 electron volts. That's OK for the clusters. The other ultra high energy, that's the AGNs that were mentioned, it's above 10 to the 19 electron volts. So that's here. That's the end of the spectrum. So yeah, there are two. But this, uh, the AGN thing, it was. It was a thing uh, maybe in 2010 or so, uh, but this correlation went down. So mm -hmm. the current situation is we don't know what the sources are. There is a, a correlation with starburst galaxies nowadays. It's actually a f almost five sigma correlation. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Centaurus A, so the nearest uh, AGN. Uh, so. yes. oh. 
That's interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I myself have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when you showed your, uh, the simulation of um, intergalactic, th the other one, the other yeah. slide that you were, um, you showed us. You also showed the graph, and I didn't get it. So can you? Yes, this one. Th this, this one. Can yeah. you explain it, please? Yeah, I, I went uh, too quick over it. Uh, let's suppose I was just going to take the pixels here in 3D, right? Take the magnetic field of each pixel and plot the distribution. That's the PDF. Then I take the cumulative distribution. That's this. Actually, this is the inverse cumulative distribution. But instead of using this model, which corresponds to this uh, line here, the solid orange line, I'm, I take another one. That's how I get the family of curves. I just have one of these uh, screenshots at a given time for every model, and I compute the magnetic field in each point, and then I divide you know, by the volume, normalize it. That gives me a cumulative probability distribution. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. Now I get it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, have uh, so I have a question regarding the the plots that were shown for the the results with the paper with Sakib. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the mechanism that you you were considering to to accelerate the particles in the cluster media? It's shock acceleration. It's magnetic reconnection. That's agnostic, right? As long as you have uh, a, the only thing that it's fixed here, it's not how the cosmic rays are accelerated, but the total cosmic ray energy. That's the only thing we fix. We don't actually follow the acceleration of the cosmic rays from low to high energies. There are two mechanisms, though. In one, you can have this is kind of almost established, I would say, that there are shocks here in clusters that can accelerate cosmic rays. That's well established. There is another mechanism. You know, you can also magnetic reconnection. You can get those processes as well accelerating. But you can also just have simple astrophysical sources that are embedded inside these clusters. Not simple, but you know, astrophysical sources embedded there. And these astrophysical sources, they are in the cluster, but they are the ones doing the acceleration. Uh, so, but the work here, it's completely agnostic with respect to the acceleration mechanism. Uh, I, th I think we have a question from YouTube or Google okay. Meet. Lodi? Oh, hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've heard about the development of cosmic ray detection techniques using field mu. There are Earth you, ray electric field detections. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, using uh, what? Field mu sensors. Uh, they're using these to measure the, the um, electric field from the, the Earth uh, rays. And they are trying to use this for, detec for the detection of uh, cosmic rays. I don't know if you've heard. I, I would like uh, to know a little more about this detection, uh, mm -hmm. but if you can talk. Yeah, I don't know uh, exactly what you're talking about, but you said there is an electric field. Yeah. We have uh, the measure of the electric field from the rays, uh, and they are trying trying to use this to detect the uh, hmm. cosmic rays. I actually I don't really know this technique. The one that does use the electric field, it's uh, radio detection here, because uh, radio emission is essentially you have like a magnetic field, and there are some vector products of the the uh, electric field. And there is also the magnetic field of the Earth in that spot. And then you get some asymmetry in the, uh, in the showers here, especially in these uh, charged components and so on. Uh, that's how radio detection works. That's the only one that directly takes the, magnetic f the electric field as an input that I'm aware of. The one that you mentioned, it might be something for, for the low energies, like AMS, uh, the AMS satellite. Like, 10 to the 12 electron volts, that would be a direct detection. That's not indirect, if uh, that's what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Do yeah, you know I, the energy? I think so. I think so. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, because if the energy is like 10 to the 12 electron volts for cosmic rays, then they don't really uh, induce showers like this. Uh, 
or actually, they might, but uh, the point is that they can be directly detected by satellites. And we do have satellites uh, in space, uh, like in the International Space Station. There are some uh, equipment there, the AMS, uh, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Uh, and then you have direct detection. OK. Any more questions here at the auditorium? Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. I have a question about the neutrinos. You told that when you, you know that neutrinos don't interact with anything, but you, you told about the transition of flavors, how it's happened. And the second question is, uh, I, underst I understood that uh, you need to construct uh, a specific detector, detector to each flavor, right? And so if you don't have this detector in the direction of this neutrino, you lost this information. And OK, uh, le let's go by parts. Uh, the first question, maybe she can answer to you, because she asked me this uh, two weeks ago <laughs> in the course. Uh, it's not like they don't interact. They can uh, interact, but it's, they don't interact significantly. In very dense environments, they do. Uh, but you know, in intergalactic space, it's not dense enough. Uh, so essentially, they don't interact. Uh, the way this happens is essentially you can think of a, maybe if I drew it, that would be helpful. Do we have a pen? Uh, Okay, so can, yeah, let me, uh, okay, this is probably going to, actually this might take a couple of minutes. Let me answer your second question and then I come back to this because this is more technical, okay. unless someone else wants to, to know it. Uh, otherwise I'll just be holding people here. <laughs> Uh, what was your second question again? The, the uh, because uh, ah, the detection, yeah, the for detection flavor, if yeah. If you only lost the information, what do you do with it? Yeah, uh, okay, that I don't need to, to draw to, to answer. Uh, what happens is that depending on the exact mechanism for the detection, uh, for example, the first neutrino detection that happened in the, I think, 40s or so, uh, Ryan and Cones, they had... Uh, a kind of, uh, this is called charge channel, uh, neutral current and charge current channels in which you have detection of neutrinos via beta decays, right? If you have a beta decay, like you have processes like this, and then you have an electron antineutrino, or you can just invert this, right? Uh, you can just uh, actually do something like this. This produces a neutron plus an antineutrino. Uh, this is one of the ways, right? If you can get like the electrons to interact with the protons or this type of beta decays, you can produce neutri electron neutrinos. If you just switch here from an electron to a positron, you get instead of an antineutrino, an actual neutrino. Uh, that's one of the channels for detection. If you are talking for, this is for new E. We have similar processes for uh, the muon neutrino and, for example, for the tau neutrino, uh, a possible detection channel is, let's suppose we have a mountain and we have like detectors here, let's suppose radio antennas, and we have a tau neutrino or antineutrino, it's the same, crossing this mountain because the mountain is denser than the air it might interact with the mountain itself, and then it will produce a tau, a tau lepton. The tau lifetime, I don't recall the number, but uh, at high energies, you know, with the Lorentz uh, boost, because it's highly relativistic if you're talking about 10 to the 15 electron volts, this will travel for order 10 kilometers or so. Therefore, if you have a mountain and an antenna or something like a detector, whatever detector it is. 
about 10 kilometers away, you can detect these taus because they interacted with the mount the tau neutrino interacted with the mountain, produced the tau, and the tau will decay, producing a signal that is detected here. So what you get is the tau decay. So this is an indirect channel for detection of new tau. This is for uh, a neutrino, electron neutrino. You also have similar channels for uh, muon neutrino that you get from uh, atmospheric showers, like these ones that I've just shown. Uh, yeah. And then uh, after this is over, I can show you how the oscillation works. Hmm? No, no, yeah, you, they always adapt to one. Th that's the whole point because, yeah, so just uh, anticipating your, your, the answer to your question, that's essentially a quantum, that's quantum mechanics, that's a unitary matrix, and therefore the matrix and its uh, conjugate, it's one, it's the identity. You don't lose anything. They just transform into other flavors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank him again. <laughs> And can we stop the transmission? Okay. And now we have the coffee.